champion swag. King of Sar, Kivo, Process, CT, DJ Super Sports, Super Sports, Super Sports, Super Sports. Sport. The souls that are forsaken, the wars that you are making. My God, body lyrics touches war torn nations. The niggas are getting restless. I tell I would be the youngest person in this room. Um, I've seen, you know, my peers be able to. Disney, better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Marcus Slaughter, chairman of the Illinois African Descent Reparations Commission. Um, and to answer the first question regarding why reparations, um, I'm probably the youngest person in this room. Um, I have witnessed uh, many of my peers um, unable to achieve their dreams, uh, whether that's you know starting a business, whether that's being able to actively uh, pursue their musical interests, or whether that's able uh, the ability to go to college and get that uh, comes back to uh, the reality of the racial wealth gap, uh, the inability to access resources. Um, so I you know began re uh, researching. Uh, during my undergraduate years and throughout grad school, ways in which we can break into that cycle um, and stop that cycle from perpetuating itself generation after generation after generation. I mean, I came to reparations as um, one of uh, the foundational pieces of stopping uh, the perpetuated cycle of poverty. Um, so that is what brought me to this work. Um, I have been blessed to be able to be in the research space and I've co-authored with uh, Dr. William Barity. I, I heard somebody mention him. Um, I also uh, have been able to be in spaces uh, with my own, you know, United Church of Christ. I am on the Illinois Conference uh, of the United Church of Christ. So, you know, great work that you all are doing here. Um, definitely looking forward to having that conversation. Um, but just being able to bring to bear all the resources that are necessary to make the reparations dream a reality. Um, and how um, the commission kind of uh, came to be, I think it's more appropriate for me to yield that to my dear brother, uh, Cam Howard, um, to talk a little bit more about the idea that he had in writing the legislation that soon became the Illinois African Descent Reparations Commission. So, uh, brother Cam, we'll give you your flowers now. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and turn it over. I think brother Cam should go. <laughs> Uh, why reparations for me, it's pretty much the same thing that Brother Marvin stated. Um, I've sent targeted resources toward the various impact of 400 years of atrocities. I've sent targeted resources that's going to naturally perpetuate itself. As uh, the last slide presentation showed in the area of wealth uh, disparity. Um, I initially, when I decided that I was going to get into the movement, uh, one, I was studying uh, to be a doctor of, natu uh, of naturopathy because I saw the health conditions in our community that was clearly a result of enslavement, the enslavement diets that we were forced to eat, some of the habits that we still have from that experience, and just the high level of illness within our community. You know, I began to see all these other things that were going wrong that were bad in our community, you know, from economics to, you know, uh, the legal system. I mean, it's just so many things. And reparations is the only thing that can deal with all of that in a comprehensive manner. So I threw away my ideas of being a doctor <laughs> and decided to get into real estate. <laughs> so that gave me some resources to actually do to engage in the struggle before resources came to the movement. But it talks about uh, why the commission. In 2019, uh, there was a black businessman who was running for mayor in the city of Chicago, and he had saw the uh, things on the news around the, the presidential election where they had to speak to reparations. So he said, I'm going to run on reparations. And so he called a meeting. And he presented a bill, which was really an anti-property bill. And I said, I said, no, that's not a reparations bill. So he said, well, you write the bill. So my organization, we subsequently wrote the legislation. And we also introduced it at the state level, uh, which became uh, the commission that Marvin was chairing. And 
For Chicago, we had already had a commission in the state of Illinois. We were actually the first state to have a commission reparations commission in 2007. It was actually passed in 2004, 2007, and 2008. The Illinois Transit Land and Slave Trade Commission delivered two reports, two documents, two uh, multi page documents, looking at what happened in Illinois in the nation of Illinois, similar to what California did, so we didn't have to do that. So what I did was write a bill that had 16 actual areas of proposed remedy, and in the state, the state chose four of the 16, and Margaret can talk about those four. The city initially approved all 16, but then it was later changed, and so we're doing something else in the city. But that's really what prompted me to actually write the legislation and perform the commission. We didn't know that Evanston was doing the same thing. In fact, uh, I was I was at a CDC meeting. And I was going to announce that Chicago was going to be the first city in the nation with the Reparations Commission, and the sister beat me to it. <laughs> and I'm so happy, and I'm so I'm so happy because she's done some tremendous things. I'm so happy that she's having so much of her and you know, as all of us are uh, following her footsteps or inspired at least by what she's done.
each other's work and support each other's work and make sure we're not duplicating efforts. And that's how I ended up on the St. Paul Recovery Act in support of Brother Traherne's initiative. On the state level, there is a, a bill that we've been pushing and we're actually re revising the bill uh, this up and coming March with now uh, Senate President uh, Bobby Joe Champion. So we'll be releasing the updates on that bill and enlisting people in that going forward. And it's very simple. The system said it best. This is about justice. This has absolutely nothing to do about how you feel. You know, this is not about your kudos and making yourself feel like some type of hero. There was a crime committed against a human family. And it's up to the rest of the human family to acknowledge their own humanity by treating and correcting the wrong against their fellow human being. And this state and this country should be a great launching pad for that. But we sit in a state that by all quality of life metrics is a great place to live and raise a family if you're white. Our elder just sat here and told you when we were doing for ourselves, doing well, they didn't run a freeway through a crime ridden neighborhood. They ran it through an economically sound, moral, just, upstanding community of productive American human beings that happen to be black. <laughs> so when we talk about reparations, this is a justice claim. And I want us to keep in mind, because I'm, I'm very, very direct and to the point, and one of the things that I understand about justice is that justice costs. Justice has pain associated with it. I get very, very nervous when I hear people talk about, oh, we're just going to have the United States government print or tack on the budget for reparations. No, 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 no. Because then my children and grandchildren have to pay the cost in inflation and that same dollar you're printing and giving us is worth less. You have to look yourself in the mirror and say, how much am I willing to pay now? So that we're not just getting your monopoly money that you print from the press that has no intrinsic value for what was lost. I'll leave it there. Well, I feel like you guys answered a little bit of this, but if anybody wanted to speak to, like, if somebody's in the room who is in a different state or whatnot, and they wanted to know, how do you actually put together? Uh, commission. I'll take the first shot. <laughs> so, with the Kansas City Reparations Coalition, we started organizing our work in 2020. And we started with working with a council person, uh, Councilwoman Melissa Robinson, and with the uh, getting the council to pass a resolution in support of HR 40. So, we started with that. And it passed unanimously through the city council. So that gave us the, uh, that inspired us to go for the commission. So as the coalition, what we did was we came up with um, a tool to vet commissioners, uh, some individuals in the community. And we um, put out a survey, people responded to it. And we chose individuals from those surveys that would be good for the commission. And then we worked with the mayor. Um, he had autonomy to choose who he wanted, uh, but he chose most of our recommendations. Um, so, which, which is great. I feel like we have a great 13 member commission. Uh, each individual is very knowledgeable about uh, the state. Uh, in, of conditions of African Americans in Kansas City in five injury areas. So we're focused on education, health care, public safety, housing, business, and economics. Uh, and so these commissioners are charged with researching how the city has been culpable in injuries to African Americans in those injury areas and developing proposals to create repair in those areas. We are. We can go. Push the button.
meeting. Well, my next question, I know I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Um, what are the goals of each of the commissions that you guys have um, put together and are on? That's a great question that I uh, I kind of was talking to Brother Kim about this last night because when I explain or describe the the work of the commission, because I will just say as a coalition member, we had a certain idea of the work of these commissioners, but now that it's playing out, it's not going exactly how we envisioned. As far as like I said, we chose these individuals because we felt they had the expertise for the research. But um, for whatever reason, many of them aren't feeling equipped for the research. So they're looking outside of themselves to conduct the research. Um, but I'm sorry, I'm using my, what's the question? What are the goals? Oh, yes, yes, oh. yes. So when I describe the goal, I say a lot because we had those five injury areas, I say, Ultimately, we want to close the wealth gap. Um, Terry Barnes, she's the chair of the Kansas City, the Mayor's uh, Reparations Commission, and she kind of pushes back on me with that. You know, why do we always have to describe it as closing the wealth gap? Which, for me, wealth is more than economic. It's more than money. It's more than economics. So I use that as really an uh, encompassing uh, state of being. Um, but the goal, really, for that commission is to do the research, to uh, ex to share the conditions of African Americans in those five injury areas, and then work closely with the community to get their ideas of what reparations should look like in those five injury areas. Because the community really has it backwards. Like the community is looking to the commission for what reparations should look like when really it's the people. It's us who should be telling the commission what reparations should look like. So that's the goal. Can you say a little bit about your five injury areas? Yes, so we really looked at what was happening across the country with other commissions and we chose those five specific areas because there's more harms than just those five injury areas. But we chose those because we felt that education, housing, health care, public safety, and business and economics were the heavy hitters of how we could achieve that wealth gap. But I brought up Brother Cam because he mentioned this um, notion that we may be um, being unrealistic on a local level of what could really be achieved. Um, for reparations because it, it really does need to come from the federal government. So I think that's why my colleague Terry kind of pushes back because she probably feels like closing the wealth gap is a huge uh, thing to accomplish for a city. So um, yeah, I do understand that, but I do also want us to understand that that term wealth is more than money. Yeah. Um, yeah, so our commission uh, is dedicated to ensuring equity, equality, and parity for um, African American descendants of, of slavery in Illinois. Um, and we're tasked with pointing that through a, a couple different ways uh, through the creation of a, a vocational center for people of African descent, so aiming at workforce development, um, through uh, preserving African American neighborhoods, so looking at housing grants, looking at taxation, looking at ways that we can grow um, home ownership, right? Um, and then also looking at ensuring equity, quality, and parity, and say contracting, right? Um, so those are three of the areas, but we have ultimately adapted uh, the 11 focus areas that California has adapted uh, to kind of give us some uniformity uh, across the movement, across the United States of America, in efforts to make it easier for when federal legislation does come down the pipeline, we have a uh, uniform you know, reporting structure, uniform focus areas uh, that the federal government can get adapted. Um, in conversation with the community, you know, we get the same thing, the, the addressing of the racial wealth gap. Um, but like my co-author says all the time, you know, 
it is impossible for states or localities to be able to foot the bill for um, closing the racial wealth gap by themselves. Um, in, in combination, $3.1 trillion uh, for uh, local and state. Uh, that's how much they have here to combine every single one of their budgets. I mean, if we look at the, the, the cost, anywhere between 14 and 18 trillion dollars uh, to close the racial wealth gap, it just is not possible on a local level to be able to close it. But the, that does not mean that we cannot dismantle some of the systems of oppression that have been put into place on the local levels that have allowed us to uh, perpetuate some of the harms that the federal government initiated, right? Uh, so that's what we're looking to do. We're looking at these focus areas and we're looking to uh, look at the laws on the books and dismantle things that have caused oppression, that have caused harm uh, to those who are descendants of slavery. Um, and you know, as we continue that work, uh, I think one of our biggest goals is definitely getting the community involved. Um, because we are not a, uh, a group of individuals who are trying to do non-transparent, backroom, smoke-filled room uh, deals. <laughs> Uh, we are attempting to be uh, the voice, the mouthpiece, and the hands of the community, and for that, we need community engagement. Um, so we have put a lot of effort into raising the profile of our commission, engaging with the community uh, in efforts to receive both their feedback on our plans um, for communication, for you know, uh, research, for recommendations, ultimately, um, but also just so that we can get a post check. It's very important for us to make sure that we have the buy-in of the community. Otherwise, when we come in with recommendations, uh, it's easier for government officials and elected officials to say, well, you don't have votes. All of this stuff sounds great. We might have passed this commission, but ultimately your recommendations won't get passed because you don't have the votes to be able to get across. So that's one of the primary objectives that we have. Great question. <laughs> Go for the commission. Uh, in 2020, right after Chicago passed their uh, legislation, in fact, it was roughly three or four days after George Floyd's murder, and it was because of what we witnessed and what the <coughs> Chicago legislators witnessed that they passed the legislation in a 14, 17 to 0 vote uh, as we presented it. Uh, we wouldn't have gotten it passed. <laughs> that hadn't happened in that fashion. Um, shortly after that time, uh, Robert Rousseff, who I mentioned earlier, asked me to write something definitive. She was getting all type of questions around reparations. She was, wasn't as, certainly wasn't as educated she is now, and she needed something that she could point um, journalists to, definitive. And so I wrote a pamphlet entitled Land and Foundation for Local Reparations. And it's been distributed nationally and has informed quite a few cities. And in that pamphlet, I, under the chapter Purpose for Local Reparations, I pretty much laid out four purposes. One is to prepare the national movement. The more local actions that we do helps us push the federal government into action. And we saw that with the, someone mentioned the Brown versus Board of Education decision. That came out of Topeka, Kansas, and it was happening all around the country in local spaces before it moved back to the federal level. And we threw, I knew that local reparations, that would be a, a goal of local reparations. But the second purpose I stated was local reparations pretty much acts as triage. And if in a disaster situation, if you don't try to save everyone, because you can't, some people are just not going to make it. But you utilize your limited resources in a way that you can provide the best ability to take to, to, to survival for as many people as possible. And local reparations is the same thing. We can't do everything on a local level. We have limited resources. So the best you can do is look at every community, look at those two, three areas that are most impactful, most, most dire in regards to African life, a black life in your city, and focus on those, and then, you know, next year you might be able to focus on a couple more, and next year you might be able to focus on a couple more. We look at Evanston, which is the only city that's actually deliberately there. They're two years working on the same initiative. They don't have probably get another year, so working on that one initiative that's restored of housing. Those are, that's the reality that we face in local reparations. So a goal is to be realistic, 
have our expectations in, a, in, a, in an area that you know we're not doing a lot of busy work. And we're never going to get to be fair because we're just doing work, and we see that a lot. Another goal of local reparations is to build structures for to receive federal resources when these federal resources come down. Right, these structures are there. Again, the earlier slide talked about mechanisms, having mechanisms in place. And so local, that's the goal of local reparations. And the final goal of local reparations is to develop programs at local levels that are actually deliberately fair that we can scale up nationally once these federal resources come, come down the pipe. In Chicago, we push with the incoming mayor what, what we call a robust reparations plan. There were four things that we wanted. We wanted a reparations commission. We wanted the office of Black and Black Chicagoans to look at equity in, in hiring. We have 30% of, of the state, 3% of the city. We should have 33% of the police force should look like us. 33% of the fire department should look like us. 33% of the sanitation workers should look like us. So that office would do that. We champion for repaying the basic income for young people. We have to look at our young youth, have to focus on our youth. Uh, the mayor approved that, and we focused on uh, the slave exposure and redress ordinance that the state is also mandated to deliver. Uh, that would actually call to question these non-governmental complicit actors. We work at every government level, but there are a lot of non-governmental complicit actors, corporations, institutions, etc., the churches that we talked about. So these are some of the things that a goal we can get around the country on the local level, where we can actually begin to create this national network and national structure. And the question was what the goals of the commissions are. Uh, ours is pretty straightforward. Uh, we guided by five essential principles, uh, some that have been modeled by Dr. Derrick and others that have been modeled by the community, dealing with, you know, the acknowledgement of the wrongs of all the racial disparities and slavery institutions that have impacted our people, followed by compensation, uh, satisfaction, guarantee of non judgments and the goal is to go through every department at a city level and figure out ways of engagement with all those essential principles and come up with quantifiable metrics and programs but actually you can measure real-time impact and real-time goals and put them on a timeline of the period of justice directly with the community. And to uh, my colleague's point, the local level isn't the war ground, but it's a great training place to figure out how to have a national approach that actually is going to have impact and we see what scales and what doesn't. And so in St. Paul in particular, we have a very small population of black people here. So to be able to do things for us and get things right is actually easier in a city like St. Paul with the robust um, resources that we have in a state like Minnesota. It's such a small, testable population. We have to use that to our advantage to make sure that everybody that's saying they want to see things differently, that we actually come up with real comprehensible plans of implementation and make sure that we're uh, assessing everything that we do putting everything on a timeline, making sure that we understand that the impact is going to be what we desire, and always think forward and also think about real modern times and real modern tools. So one of my pet peeves is, you know, anybody that knows me knows I'm a data junkie. One of my biggest gripes when I hear people talk about things like median household income, no shade, but what it leaves out in the median is that you're taking an average that a lot of people may not even be obtaining. And rolling that into a figure that, again, creates comfort because it makes things seem more manageable than they actually are. What do I mean? I would rather use a mean average because in a mean average, if I have 100 people, and of that 100, let's say 10 make $100,000 a year, you have five that make a million plus, and then you have about We'll say 25% that make maybe 30 to 40,000, and then the rest make less than 13,000. But when you do the median math, 
and you'll come up with a figure around thirty to forty-five thousand dollars as an average. But we look at the metrics of the hundreds of people, you have only four people or forty percent of those people actually live in your promotion. So to tell them that they're surviving on forty, thirty thousand dollars when the reality is they're only seeing twelve and thirteen is just ludicrous evidence. So we have to take into account metrics and tools and formulas that tell the real story so that we can formulate policy. Oasis. The sad, sad reality is we're not. Now there's a huge opportunity in front of us. One of the things that gets me kicked out of a lot of room with some of the funders that I would have loved to have worked with, however, I couldn't shake the question. When God puts something on my spirit, I have to ask because I'm not up here for myself. I'm up here for my community and my ancestors. So my question to them became, how is it that you have $50 million to give out every two to three years? Now that's a different kind of question because obviously there's a wealth mechanism that keeps the foundation's coffers full every so often. And my question becomes, why is it that when we start the conversation about reparations, we don't start by setting up same said mechanisms to fund the work so that the people who are on the front lines of doing this work in the community that needs desperate resource can begin to get what I call an economic IV. Instead, we leave them on hospitals in critical condition. But the short answer is we're practicing at a municipal level, and our goal is to create some of those mechanisms to see what works. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just want to remind the audience, you know, if you feel something that you feeling in your spirit, it is okay to clap. It is okay to shout. It is okay to stand up. Do what you need to do. Let's energize here, right? Um, also, so many people. Um, in terms of the people, like, what do they do? Um, just so we may have some of the similar people that's out here in this audience that, you know, like, oh, I can't do that work, you know. Um, so you know? I am not, so the Chicago Commission has not been established yet. Um, when we wrote the legislation, it was passed for commission. Chicago politics is dirty, believe me. Uh, the mayor <laughs> pulled that vote, you know, nullified that vote, substituted the commission for a subcommittee, and it was all ugly like that. It was not of the community, which was really established. The Illinois Commission was determined by the governor and the state legislatures to determine who would actually be sitting on that commission. When I wrote the federal legislature, I also had a, a hand in revising the federal legislation, H.R. 40. The National African American Reparations Commission went to Congress and Congress in uh, 2015 and said we wanted to revise the legislation. And I was appointed to be the lead writer. And when I wrote that legislation, I specifically wrote that in the commission, along with experts, but you had reparations experts. Because you can be an expert in economics, and you can be an expert in education, and in a whole lot of different areas, but if you don't know how 
the continued impact plays out from the atrocities that were committed in that area, you're missing some things. And that's where the reparations expert comes into play. And there's not many reparations experts on commissions, which is something that, you know, you, you really have to make sure we, in your community you find someone who really understands the whole idea of continued impact and how there's that chain of injury that, that occurs. Uh, and if it's led, it doesn't have necessarily have to be led by a reparations expert, but that, that view has to be there. Um, there's a lot of brilliance in black America all around the, all around, uh, the country. And I made a statement in the Edison conference that everywhere I go, I see so many brilliant black minds doing this work. And if we can find ways to ensure that everyone on the commission knows the mandate, because all commissions have different mandates, I'm going to talk about that a little later tonight. Everybody on the commission has to know the mandate of that commission. And if they know the mandate of the commission and they're being fed by, you know, this whole concept of continued injury, continued impact, looking at those five areas of full repair from an international level, then the commission can come out successful in their work. So in Kansas City, as I've shared, we have the Kansas City Reparations Coalition, who was instrumental in helping getting that mayor's commission on reparations seated. So the coalition is made up of several black-led community groups. Um, the National Black United Front Kansas City Chapter, St. Kofa for Kansas City, Bahamas Moss 30, Urban League of Kansas City and Urban Summit of Kansas City. And the commission is made, so when the coalition started organizing, we knew that we wanted the commission to be made up of individuals who lived in certain zip codes, that injury was persistent. Um, we knew that we wanted elders who had lived experience on the commission. We knew that we wanted uh, researchers, people who knew about research, and people who knew about reparations. So we, I, I'm so bad with names. We have 13 commission seats. There's 12 field. Where, where we are. The other uh, parameter we had was youth. We wanted youth on the commission. So we had two. Uh, we have a, a senior in high school. Our name is Madison Lyman. And we had a gentleman named Ryan Sorrell who headed up the um, public safety injury area and he's uh he's runs the defender which is making great strides in media had either they live in a certain zip code that it, you know deals with reparations or they have lived experience or uh they are new um as things evolve there was uh things that happened that we actually had two co-chairs one of the co-chairs is now on the commission, and uh, the other co-chair is an ex-officio for the commission. So uh, when we needed a chair, because of the passion and work that I put in as a volunteer, other members felt like I could be the chair. But so many times, I, I don't know all the history that uh, we've endured in this country related to chattel slavery and Jim Crow and all that. So sometimes I do not feel um, as adequate to be in this role, but I know God chose me. Oh, so we all have a role to play. And we can all continue. We all can keep learning as well. Sure. It's a growth process. Yeah, we, we have a similar makeup. We made sure that the commission at large uh, was made up of ADOS community members, elders, youth, uh, making sure that we have people from different skill sets and, and walks and background and a very limited uh, seat for politicians. So, um, in fact, I don't think any of them are even allowed on the commission at all, but there is a liaison that we had a hiccup. Uh, with the liaison that was selected. I think we, we figured that out. Uh, it's a lot of qualified black people that got skipped over, and we kind of started off 
doing the same exact thing that we're trying to get away from by disqualifying black folks from speaking up for black folks. So uh, we got that taken care of, but yeah, we have a similar makeup. And uh, again, we, we deal with people who are called. Everybody's not an uh, economic expert, reparations expert, uh, even a politician or politically inclined. Some people just know right is right and wrong is wrong. And they're not willing to back down and we stand with them, they stand with us and we support one another. So um, we're just getting started too and we're kind of looking forward to, you know, the first level of engagement. So we'll have a better answer after, you know, we've had a month or so of operation. Thank you, thank you. Um, I know that each one of you have had, you know, different challenges as you're doing this work. Uh, can you talk about, you can talk about some of the challenges as well as um, structures of support um, that you need in order to do the work? The, um, there are several areas of challenges. Mm -hmm. Challenges with white America uh, who have these opinions of why reparations You already got reparations, you know, dealing with all those challenges. Um, we've had to, we wouldn't be in this space now that we're in the movement if we hadn't dealt with those challenges. And we still have to deal with them in order to get the resources. We, we dealt with it enough to get these commissions and things established, but in order to get the resources to be targeted, we're going to have to continue to deal with those type of challenges in the minds of white America. And we're winning in that space. Uh, then there's challenges within the movement itself. Um, talk a little bit about that a little later, some of the contentions within the movement. Um, navigating those contentions uh, is, is challenging. And also, um, I guess the other area of challenges would be uh, staying focused. Staying focused. Um, it's easy to, to take your mind off the mission if you're dealing with all the distractions. Mm -hmm. And trying to keep people focused on the mission. This is to care about people. You know, it's not all these other things. You know. And so that's the that's challenge within it. And those, those are moving challenges. So I would, I would just say those three, three areas uh, are challenges that we have to deal with. And the other one was support that we're getting. Yeah. Our allies are great in the movement right now. We have allies in the faith-based community, as we heard today in the earlier um, panel, in the uh, Japanese-American community. Allies there. We get support from corporations. We get support from uh, universities. You know, a lot of universities are stepping up with research. We get support from philanthropy for the first time in the movement. I stated earlier how, you know, being a real estate investor, I was funding in COBRA primarily for a long time, but now there's millions of dollars in the movement to do work. So that's a tremendous amount of support. And they're allowing us, that's allowing us to really take advantage of the technology, take advantage of the, the data, take advantage of all this other new area of knowledge.
about politics. And I will just say that as well, um, full transparency, because if we don't talk about the real, we won't be able to navigate it or push through it. But uh, black people, like I feel like we have made Started meeting with the mayor. I think I shared with you guys last night. We didn't know that he had joined more mayors organized against uh, mayor, mayors organized for racial equity. But when we started meeting with him about forming the commission, he really already thought he was doing repair reparations work, which it was really just regular policy. Um, so. You know, helping people really understand what reparations is, that's a challenge. Um, navigating the terrain of politicians, not making it about individual agendas, because it is about the collective. Um, but I will say for support, it's all of us on the side of justice. That's who our supports are. So first repair, um, to, Robin Simmons and her team, I mean, they're really invested in ensuring that all these reparations initiatives have what they need. Um, a brother Kim, NARC, um, and Cobra, those are the resources that we look to to um, get information on how to navigate the terrain and really inspiration. That's needed a lot because this work is very ta uh, taxing. It's very emotionally draining, so we need those um, instances to be encouraged and to be inspired to keep pushing forward. Could you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so challenges, I'll try to keep this uh, short and productive. Um, you laugh because you know the pain. Uh, one of the difficult things that I see in front of us in this entire movement is we're on a moving spaceship. I used to say train. And the reason I use that term is the world is getting smaller. Technology is expanding. There's things that are looming uh, on the horizon that are getting ready to impact, you know, people all over the world, in particular in America. We have a AI boom and all types of things that's getting ready to put millions of people out of work. And so there's already talks about things like universal basic income and making sure that people receive, you know, idly Champion swag, King of Sar. Kivo, Process, CT, DJ, Super Sport, Super Sport, Super Sport, Super Sport. The souls that are forsaken, the wars that you are making. My God, body lyrics touches war-torn nations. The natives are getting ready.